Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining Wild China's 56th event since COVID started. <laughs> My name is John May, and I'm the founder of Wild China, and um, I will be hosting today's uh, conversation with um, Xi Ren. As some of you already know, if you are a longtime follower of our events, we host a monthly book club, and we read a book every month. And in January this year, we read The Good Women of China. And we are honored and excited to have Xi Yan, the author, joining us from the UK. Um, and she will talk a little bit about why she wrote the book and uh, give us some background. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, I encourage you to buy it. Amazon, ebook, wherever, right? Together with a box of tissue paper. That is a warning. <laughs> we will try not to spoil the plot today. Um, regardless, um, you really uh, want to read it because you want to look at China and, and meet these Chinese women through Xinjiang's eyes, uh, who really, they really see this, the suffering, the beauty, and love of all Chinese women from all different fields of um, different professions or um, parts of China. And she sees them with so much compassion. I just, I, I can't tell you, she and it was a very touching read. Um, so before we start, I'll talk a little bit about Xinyan Yan herself, a little background. Xi Yan was born in Beijing in 1958 and worked for Chinese radio in Nanjing in the 1980s. That's why I chose the song to kick us off. And that song by Fei Xiang called A Fire in Wintertime was, was a hot throb, like a sensation in the 80s, right? Um, but Xi Yan then moved to the UK in 1997 and uh, wrote for The Guardian. And today she um, resides in the UK, in London as an author and a consultant. Uh, for international media group uh, working with China. She also speaks very frequently on TV and radio, so we are very honored to have her. In addition to The Good Women of China, this was her first book and translated over, I believe, 40 languages. Right? And she has also authored eight other books. Is the number correct? Or you've updated it? I'm sure by the end of this year, probably another book, right? Um, and in 2004, she also founded a charity. It's called The Mother's Bridge of Love, which is dedicated to reaching and enriching the lives of Chinese children in all corners of the world. Those adopted by Western families, those raised abroad, and those living in China. As someone who is trying to raise my own children in the United States, I think this is a, a worthy, truly worthy cause. And I encourage you to get involved or donate if there's time, if there's interest. And uh, we will share the link in follow-up commun communication. So, Xi Yan, I'm going to hand um, the room back to you and uh, tell us a bit about your book. And again, thank you for taking the time. Hello, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. Nihao. Um, first of all, I want to thank people and the, even the coronavirus and us in the door. But we still have the chance or the passion to share what happened in the outside the door and in the world. Now, so I really want to thank people. And for your interest in China as my roots country and my roots culture. And today I'd like to share something with you about uh, uh, my experience in China. Okay. And also I have to say, I'm speaking uh, Chinglish, not English. And so I'm trying my best. If I can't work out any words, I'm sure May will help me as well. So uh, let's see. Uh, my screen. So that is a bit of my background. And uh, when I started my radio show in 19, late 80s, uh, I did the research until, actually until this morning, I interviewed someone from China. 
And also, I travel around China more than 20 provinces, face to face interviewed people, more than 308 Chinese, I would say women. And uh, yes, I publish eight books and included the Good Woman China. And that was uh, in over, I think it's uh, 49 languages. Anyway, I don't think I'm qualified to talk what China is because I know I'm the only one drop of the water of this huge ocean of its uh, over 3,000 years recorded civilization and also with a 1.4 billion population and the living in the country, the whole size is like same as the um, group. Oh dear, how can I move this? Mm -mm. Uh, sorry, I don't you know how to operate in PowerPoint and it will keep, it will show up on Zoom. So I need, I'm so sorry. I just go to what? my PowerPoint, forgive me. And uh, continue the sharing of the screen. I use this one, maybe we can do that. Sorry, I should pra practice before, and I do apologize to everyone. Now you can see I'm not good about that. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> so can you see this one? Perfect. Okay, so that is first page. Let's do the second page. And this is from 1989. I was a journalist until last February, 2020. I traveled around China. You can see where I have been. And uh, actually um, some green colors, you can see four to five green colors. This is what I did from 2019 to uh, September. So December 2019 to February uh, 2020 last year. So I went back to China and continue my research. Since I left China in 1997, I always go back, went back twice a year um, because I have to re-educate re myself, update my knowledge about China because China has been changed so fast. Not even the generations as a scientist science knowledge is like two, three years. It could be the generation in many ways. So this is why I went back to China very often. And this is I've been in China last year and in Nanjing, Shanghai, Henan, and Hainan, Hangzhou, and Guilin. So I have learned a lot what's really happened recently in China. Because 2019 was invited to United Nations in um, Geneva. And I, we got a report that Asian women commit suicide 500 times in the last five years. So I was really shocked by this uh, report. So I went back to China. I want to confirm um, this number is reasonable and what cost this kind of um, serious problem. So this is why I went back to China. So that page is I called is uh, between the visible and the invisible. I'm quite sure everybody has been China. We can see the top line in the big cities. China has the 665 cities. And uh, everywhere, particularly in the capitals or over 50 bigger cities, we can see the, you know, very modern, very rich, and the people's life is much better. And also, if you go to the bookstore, you can see lots of the migrants, and the children, um, they all went to the um, bookstores to read because they couldn't afford the books and also many of them still didn't have the smartphone or even computers. And uh, of course, the cars is become a huge market in China. But if we see the bottom line, 
that is invisible part of China. For example, I got the picture on the left, bottom on the left, it's from the farmer's market. So when I took the picture to show the class during my lectures around the world, I found very, very few Chinese students who could say the name of the food. This kind of food being in China over the last 3,000 years, even our grandparents or our parents still eat them and also the follow the season of this kind of food. Some are from origin China, but some is influenced by the Westerners or by the modern time. And in the middle, uh, the bottom line is a very nice, uh, you know, Chinese New Year alien. But Feng Ji Cai, I believe everybody knows him, is a head of the China heritage system. And he's looking for someone and read this language you now. Because the last person after read this Dalian, he passed away. And no one could understand this minority language anymore. This actually amazes hometown Yunnan. It's from one minority group. And on the right side in the bottom, actually everybody can see it in any city, even in the big capital city or even Beijing. In fact, I took the picture in Beijing just one street away from Wang Fuji. So that is the people living there, the daily life there, and the folk collect the rubbish to make the city clean and nice, but back to their own life, living in this kind of forgotten, um, maybe forgotten corner. So next picture I want to tell you is all of my book come from the people I interviewed. And uh, they are my life teachers. I have uh, so many stories I want to share with you. But today I only, what is it, time allowed me to share this kind of very short story uh, from my books. Oh, poor, poor. It's a story from a uh, China witness. Yeah. She's the medicine lady. From the signs you can see, actually she set up her tiny shop just next to the uh, local uh, broadcast station. And she was the very first person among the 308 people I interviewed. She loved the art revolution. So when I asked her why, she said, you know, during that time, everybody fighting to each other and the hospital stopped, the nurse school stopped, the medicine school stopped. But they can't stop the human body the trouble. So when people had the trouble, they come to me. So I made a lot, lots of money, the culture revolution. So that made me think when we see the history, we always from you know part of the personal experience, part of the from our education, uh, part of from our religion or culture beliefs, or even the personal view. Again. What is real history? History should be colorful. Everybody has a different view. The same issue of history. So Yao Pope become my favorite lady. And she had told me so much, include a new disease. She called um, McDonald's shoulders. <laughs> when I asked her why it was McDonald's shoulders, and she said, when the people use computer, and eat McDonald's, so they should feel the sore and the pain. So I know how to treat it. So nowadays we use the mobile phone. So I know many friends had a hand problem. I think Yao Po might have a new medicine for that as well. Next one, these places I've been more than four times. It's called Ling Huan. It's a tiny town in the Anhui, next to uh, Hefei, the capital of the Anhui. Linghuan used to be a very rich town in Sui and the Tang dynasty. 
and because the big canal and was the branch there, so lots of business folks they spend the nights there and have the rest all update their uh, supplies. So about late uh, two hundred years later, when this uh, canal the water drowned, so the little town be left. This town is very famous, uh, very well known. In many ways, the first of all, they have a largest, the longest old earth wall in the town. The earth wall, you can see, is over uh, at least 1,300 years ago. Yeah? And the secondly, they had a special tiles in the street. So, this is the only way. Only place in the world we can find. most of the tiles they covered like this uh, protect the roof from the waters. Only in Linghuan the tiles is lie down, lie down in this way. They call the single tiles. So that is a part of world heritage as well. And also Linghuan, when I first time went there, there was a street. About over 20 houses in the whole street is a start from a Ming Dynasty. All the buildings construction without any metal nails. Everything made by wood. When we interview them, when I first time discovered Ling Huan by this, uh, you know, people's letters say, oh, Ling Huan had some remarkable history. So I went there. And I met this gentleman. This gentleman's position or title of the job called a news singer. Ling Huan, because very poor in the last four or before the 1980s, was very, very poor. Until we went there in 2005, they still had the, you know, 10 renminbi yuan, you can build a, it's like a market. It's a very poor place. And uh, because of this kind of place, and the, lots of the local traditional custom have been forgotten or have been left there, included this news singer. He didn't know. He, okay, how do I say? Because they are so poor, it's uh, from uh, anywhere, this little town. So each generation, they send the one, two people outside of the town to trade, to buy some salt or medicines, and also to collect the information back to the town. Then these two people will see the news at the tea house. The tea, <clears throat> tea house is their uh, like a high quarter of the village. So everybody has a problem or justice or fighting. <clears throat> they went to the tea house for the, you know, uh, Justice. So the news singers every month were seeing the news because the local people for the 1960s, they hardly know how to read and write. So this gentleman called the Mr. Wu, when I interviewed him, he didn't know how to speak properly. So every single word he speaks is like a poem. He's seeing the story for you. Even you ask him who you are, what's your name? She would say, <laughs> he didn't know how to say properly the sentence. So I went back four times, interviewed him, and also brought Mar uh, the team from uh, um, American, French, and uh, UK to sweet local authorities own destroy the street because this is the only street in China, maybe in the world. So this is Ling Huan. I really recommend it. If you have time people to see it, maybe now it's a change. The one thing never been changed. That is a generation past the stories still there. Uh, next one. I met this shoe repair in the capital of Henan. I really admire this lady. When I heard from the volunteer said she 
did this shoe repair in the street for 20 years. She always show off. She said, she told the people, her children are in the university. No one believed her. So when I interviewed her, the very beginning, she really looked down me. She even didn't bother give me look. So after almost like two hours, and she said, you're still here. I said, yes, I want to talk to you. And I said, I want to visit your house, have a lunch with you. Because that is the way to respect the people from the poor and from the poor countryside. If you go to the house to talk to them, say, I would like to you know, have a meal in your house. They were so happy. They thought you respect them and you treat them as family. So when I asked her, um, can I have lunch with you? I can buy the lunch, but I like to have the lunch in your house. And this lady looked at me with a very sharp eyes, said, are you, you really want to do it? I said, yes, I do. I didn't realize what her words mean. So she tidied up her business. Uh, and she took me to her home. Her home, her house, actually in a public toilet, in a factory. The factory is closed and no one there. So the couple, she and her husband, took the position like a housekeeper or daughter to look after the gate. So by the gate, there is a tiny public toilet that the couple lived there and brought up her son and a daughter. They are both in the university. When I talked to them, one was in Beijing University, one was in Xi'an in the PhD. And this lady, when she talked to me about her proud, after my telephone, I was very stupid. I called her children. It's like a confirm her story is a truth or not. And uh, when I, you know, after talking to her children, she cried loud. She said, I brought up my children on this toilet. In the night, we put a wooden board on the toilet hole and we slept there. In the daytime, we use the water from the public the toilet to cook it. But I brought up my children without anyone help without a penny from the government, I sent them to the university. I have done much more in the Greek world than the city people. I was so, so moved by her. Because during my interview, I have heard so many complaints or so many unhappiness and so many, you know, this Chinese woman gave me something help me understand how China survived from last hundred years. This kind of civil war, warlords war, or anti America, the uh, Japanese, or you know, even the between the Kuomintang and the Kuomintang, or even the political killings, storms. But we brought up new generation in such a short time. You know, when I was little before 1970s, I remember I took a long queue for one piece of tofu and cooking oil. But now China and start buying street from Paris, by the bigger part of the from London, and set up so many business in America, everywhere, only 40 years time. So when people said China, you know, dropped so quickly because the political policies or something else, the, for my personal belief, it's the Chinese beliefs and from generations to generations, from grandparents, even they never been educated. Through the three meals a day, we all learned what we should do what we should do. So that is something I think is the soul of a Chinese culture, 
the Chinese, you know, um, how do you say, leaves. So this is why I often to ask myself, and uh, how much do we know about the last generation and other people's life, the culture and truth? And until this morning, you know, after interview someone in China who lost her daughter, become a suicide, the mother could understand why the daughter gave up the life. So my question is, do we understand each other, different generations? And also, I really like to think about the Chinese, what China has gained and lost in the last 40 years. Yes, we become rich, we become a power. How much we really understand or carry it from last generations, from our over 3,000 years of civilization, what we proud of ourselves in front of the world. So that I'd like to share with you. And uh, thanks, uh, while well, China introduced my charity. Yes, my charity, the Mother's Bridge of Love, actually uh, we build up three bridges between the, about the children to their first parents, because over 150,000 Chinese children be adopted by 27 countries. But to help them to see the real China, or why they are being bonded. And also in China, we built up 27 village libraries because when we live in the, such a modern life with a computer or smartphone, I can tell you many children in the poor countryside, in the deep mountains, they have struggled with reading the books, the papers and the stationaries the sport items. And also we have lots of Chinese students or overseas students go to China travel to see what China is in their own eyes, on their own feet. So I believe that kind of experience is the best education, your knowledge, understand the culture and the human life. Thank you. Thank you. It's the, the, the stories Xinan just told, uh, just snippets, tiny little sliver view of what the books contain, the stories like, like the lady who brought up her children in the toilet. Unbelievable. Um, and I often feel like, you know, China today, when our, while China clients go there, we have the Peninsula Hotel, we have the Bulgari Hotel, it's glitzy and fancy. But when you peel the onion one layer down, the human stories, there is a lot more um, complexity and texture. And thank you for taking the time to interview them and bring their stories to us. It's, it's, invaluable um, addition. So now I have a couple of questions. When I was reading your book and they were like raging in my head. Uh, one is I noticed this recurring theme of uh, sexual education, right? Or, or the lack of it really. Um, and, and I don't think China is alone uh, in vast amount of countries. This may be very uh, common. Uh, in your stories, the lack of knowledge um, in these women um, would lead to you know, sexual matters, confusions, or in certain circumstances, rapes that they don't, they're not even aware, but it causes so much trauma, right? Now, to contrast that is I brought up my own children, both partially in China and partially here. And the teenage girl, like this was uh, two years ago, she came home from middle school and she said, we have a science experiment and it's about collecting data and proving a point. And I said, what, what science project are you gonna, go, are you gonna do? She goes like, I'm gonna measure the absorption of tampons. And wow. I, I, I was speechless, <laughs> but her teachers said, great. Go ahead, right? And and I don't think this. Uh, I, I don't know if my experience. My children are half Chinese and half American. So my, my question there is: in your 
years of traveling back in China. Is this something that is also changing in China? Uh, or is it still taboo that among the people that you interview? So the changes that I'm experiencing is part of China as well. What about the people you're interviewing? Is this changing the attitude on sex ed? Or yeah, well, I think at the first of all, uh, I have to say depends on where are they and who they are. And the inner cities, no question, very modern, very open, you know, like a group uh, in Beijing, they set up this kind of uh, clubs or organization called Rang Yin Dao Shuo Hua. No. And yes, very shock when I heard about it. Like, uh, you know, how do you say in English? Managing fee or something. Yeah. Let the vagina speak. Uh, yes, <laughs> they are doing this. And uh, so, and also, I have a friend called me say, Xin, I just totally lost, you know, and my granddaughter now, and very proud, and ask me. And uh, she can't, she can't be virgin. She has to be the woman. Otherwise, she could be looked down and laughed at by her classmates in the university second year. This is completely from our age. You know, yeah. I remember it. I was very naive, you know. I'm not, you know, I'm not proud to say this is the truth. So when I was 22, I was in the university and uh, I had a war. And the head of the university and set up this kind of party in the night, in the evening. And uh, so he tried to, you know, give me a hug or even hold my hand. I refused because I read the book, Yuan <laughs> Feng I read the book. The first paragraph said uh, they, you know, they hand each other. And the second, uh, in the moon, and then, uh, in the moonlight, they hand each other. And the second, uh, Paragraph, they said, you're pregnant. So I did believe <laughs> if you did that in the moonlight, you could be pregnant. I was 22. But now in China, so open. But when I interview the lady on February, no, um, December 2019, last trip in China, in Yangshuo, in the Yangshuo. I interviewed the lady. She was, uh, she sold sweet potato in the street. Actually, it's not street, in the, in, in the field to give the people the passing. And then I asked her, I said, uh, why are you are alone? Who do you live with? Where is your family? And then she said, my children went to city, my village is disappeared because the young children become a tourist area and uh, all the traditional village uh, is gone. So I said, uh, if you have a problem with your body or how, how do you do and who can help you? Then she said, no, everybody just hold the bottle. You kill yourself. I was really shocked. I said, why? And, I, and she was like very shy to say, oh, I have a problem, my female, the woman part always had a problem when I gave my kids, the birth to my kids. I said, yes, I can introduce some doctors to you. And she was like, no, 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 no. No one can see my body. And otherwise my parents will kill me in heaven. So that kind of, you know, it depends on which generation or in where part of the China. It's no such a Chinese woman there. It's a, Different generation in different era, in different time or different kind of living condition, they will give you completely different answers. So, so, the, so the story, the squealing woman was recent, just last year? Yes, uh, yes so just a year, uh, 2019, she was in her late 50s. Mm. Yeah. So the, I guess the learning there is, is there is just no one China, right? China in 40 years has condensed the very villages like Shouting Hill to Manhattan, New York, um, all in one country over a time span. Or even in the Gansu, you know, even in the Lanzhou, even in the Xining, it's a, the city next to the Shouting Hill, that's completely different. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, th- I think that is that is very true. Well, we you know, it's very interesting when you mentioned the shouting hero. We went back in two thousand five. You know, I interviewed uh, first time was in nineteen ninety five. So I went back to that area, and uh, I discovered something very interesting. I thought the local authorities didn't care about this group of people because uh, they are a mixture between the Mongolian, Latins and the uh, Muslim and the Han people mm-hmm. is the, it's on the border between the different people in that area it's called the Sanxi area. It's a very poor area in China. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I asked the local people, why you haven't moved? You know, I heard about the China the government said, we'll move you to the town because you don't have the water here. It's basically right. living condition. Then the head of the village said to me, we did. Then we move back by ourselves. I said, why? And he told me something I never thought about. And he said, we moved there for a few weeks. We couldn't understand the live with the noise. Easy noise, easy colors, easy crowded, and scared speed. I didn't thought about it. And he said, you know, people's, I think it's the, from his body language, a bicycle. He said, very fast past you, scared you. Very noisy. You don't know the sounds come from where. It's for what? Very busy. You're just exhausted by that. Then he decided to put his family back to the poor village. Really which is no water there, even the grass was gray. Wow. Yeah, yeah. this was the movement they call the Xinongsun Zhengce, the yeah. new countryside policy that they moved yeah. all the villagers to, to new yeah. places. I mean, other parts of the country, I've seen most people settled in the new villages and leaving the old villages sort of in, uh, you know, just fall down by itself. Uh, on Shouting Hill, that, that, which is one of the stories where Xinan's book ends on, that you mentioned the possibility of tourism coming in to appreciate the, the haunting, desolate beauty of such a remote place. Uh, did, uh, since I am in travel, so I am curious, did this happen to them? Do you have any updates on that? Did, did they have to, do they have tourism now? Are there people benefiting from? Uh, in Shouting Hill, no, no, in Shouting Hill, uh, not yet. Actually, something happened was pretty funny because government built on the beautiful highway system in that area from 2003. So when we, when I went back 2010, even the, you know, six, five years, mm-hmm. the road was there, it's no car. It's like between the two hours, finally you hit someone and both sides stop, say, hey, hello, because of no car there, no one there. Okay. The road was there already. And uh, then you come to the highway service, uh, you know, Wuzhan station mm-hmm. and with a public toilet there and use it. And the local people are interesting. They put their first gold into the public toilet. Put what? So I put this to the year. Oh. First of all, uh-huh. figures, okay, in the public toilet. So I asked the staff there, I said, why they do that? And the staff told me, he, she come from a local village as well. She said, we never had a beautiful place like this. So. Elders people thought there must be the, something like heaven. So we should put the God in the best place. <laughs> so it, you see the knowledge, the, the way they see the lives of beliefs, religions in a very different way and also limited by their experience as well. Wow, yeah. So 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 to they wanted to respect their gods, so they put yeah. the gods in the public toilet because it's yeah. the shiniest building. Yes, yeah, the shining, the lights and the water. And the, so this is why I like to remind people, if you go to this kind of village, you see something in the, you know, the road service, you they hang on something, don't touch it. 
but that is a part of the local people's prey. Yeah. We shouldn't respect them. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, Sheena, I was also struck. I've seen some of that, but not uh, quite that. Room. Some of the areas like say Ningxia, which is a, uh, you know, very nearby near, Sanxi. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Very near where you were talking about, right? Yeah. They have a mix of Mongolians and Muslim uh, ethnic groups there. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, it was so poor. But when I was invited to go there by the Yellow River, they built this cluster of incredibly beautiful, they look like Morocco, like uh, beautiful designer boutique hotels there. And Chinese would drive their BMW or Mercedes um, for five hours and to get there and spend 2,000 RMB, it's like $300 a night. In the contrast of locals living what you just described, probably it's just next door and the tourists are already descending in places like that. It is the new China. Yeah, yeah. Right. I saw that in Hainan this uh, last time, in Yangshu as well. Yeah. In Yangshu, just by the, yeah. Yeah. Far away from the very smart hotel. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. Right. right. Now, now I want to ask a little bit about you uh, in writing, right? One thing that struck me a lot when I was reading the stories is how much you invest your own emotions, time. You, you, in certain cases, you took days and nights to just be with the uh, interviewee, uh, your, your, your story protagonist and become, you truly become their companion, their confidant sometimes, right? But there, there are so many people that you meet and you end up, you have to leave. You have to somehow for your sanity, probably extract yourself emotionally. Describe for us how, what your emotional arch was like, you know? I think I've been trained by Chinese women. When I start my radio show, you know, when I start talking to people in, 19, in late 80s, um, so after a few weeks, I got so many letters, people uh, write to me, and most of them, I would say more than 80%, they are women. I was really shocked by what they talk about themselves. Almost of them, each single of them say they're bad women, you know, and they feel the guilty because the husband or parents or uh, mother-in-law or village people. The, so I was, I couldn't understand. I brought up in the, you know, the cities. I never traveled in the countryside until I become a journalist. So this is why I decided to give myself re-education, to know my country and to know the people. And when I read the letters, I couldn't understand why people feel so guilty and why they thought they're not well, but they're not good women, you know. So when I start interview people, when I listen to them, and I realize I'm part of them too. Because during my childhood, my, my parents both sent it to the it's a critical prison. And uh, it was like a, a critical orphan. So everybody hated me and uh, people can abuse me and bully me. And I didn't believe I was a bad girl. I come from a bad family. Um, but I didn't realize the whole China, so many women who wrote to me, they thought the same things. And uh, I was, I think the first morning call was a 19 years old girl. And she wrote to me, I didn't know the letter. Um, no, she wrote to me, she said, uh, I'm a very bad girl, you know, because uh, I was touched by a boy in the street. And uh, my parents said I should die. And the village people said, uh, you are dirty men already. You've never been married. You, no one want, wanted you. And the girl said to me in the letter, say, uh, Xiran, what, what I did is not I wanted. Is he come to me, kissed me, and uh, touched me. And the girl said, if you couldn't uh, reply me, 
and I have to die. Now, I didn't know that I didn't take it serious, and uh, then later on, she died. So after that, I realized uh, that the, their letter is really meaning, meaning something. So if I'm there, I'm just a drop of water, and for them, this tiny green has survived. Just listen or talk to the family. Mm. Well, I don't know. So like this morning, I talked to the mother. The mother called me, asked me why. I asked myself afterwards, yes, why? Because I think we didn't, no chance to listen to the girl. So she killed herself. She's, you know, 16 years old. Wow. It's very lonely. All these kind of things, I think I've been educated or trained, this kind of needs of myself experience. Mm -hmm. I, when I was little, you know, when the red guard beat us, when one person attacked me, gave me one hand, mm -hmm. I could survive, avoid the one beat. Yeah. I, I think that is, is not a, my, myself, some special skill or something in being trained. Mm -hmm. then, this is why when my later husband, unfortunately, uh, he passed away, called the COVID ED, he loved China, I think, more than me. And when he chose the title for the book, I was very, very moved that he said, just gave the book called The Good Women of China. Because from a Chinese stand, he travel in China quite a lot. He said none of them rich, power, beauty, celebrity, or the, but they all had love mm -hmm. and you know, to their children, the family, and also the self belief. So they gave and they gave to others. So they are a good women. So I love that title. Thank you for sharing that. I love the title too. Now, um, now that I know the backstory, um, I, I can't imagine like in your position, you must have gone through uh, your form of PTSD, um, you know, post-traumatic syndrome, <laughs> after interviewing all these people. Maybe writing for you is a healing process. Is yes, also it's kind of powerhouse, you know, drive you to the story, to the next story. Because for those people, they hardly had a chance to speak out. And also, so many of them want to share. And even you can hear their heart shouted out, say, I'm not alone. It's just there, someone there, listen to me or, you know, help me. I feel in that way, very strong. Yeah, um, that's so nice. Uh, uh, we already have a few questions submitted um, prior okay. to the session. Let me quickly run through some of them. I think um, Dorothy asked about how do contemporary women deal with the problems of maintaining a job, caring for a house, family, and elder people in the family? Well, the very, very good question. Actually, I'm still searching the answer for the question uh, because like my last book, uh, The Promise published the last year, and this is the paperback. The Promise. Uh, at The Promise. In the book, I um, wrote about the um, eating story through the four generation of one family. So actually that is kind of a journey to my own family as well. Then you see the Part of four is my son's generation. When I interview the young children, young women, about their view, about the family, about the career, about the, you know, and how to see themselves. And they see, you can see, I think that they're in the mood. <laughs> in, my, in my knowledge, it's a long way to understand them, but you can see they struggle as well between the traditional Chinese education, family needs, and the modern society, Western influence. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's not easy for them. This is why I 
paid more and more attention to this generation since I published the uh, I Meet the Sky, and I interviewed a group of overseas Chinese uh, students, how they think about uh, as a single child. You know, everybody treated them like a son or emperors or something, but we never gave them a chance to listen to them. It's not easy for them living the lonely. Their living is like a rich island. You know, they got everything, nothing, because nothing surround them as their uh, siblings, siblings or same age societies or family. You know, they can share. They're very, very lonely, very lonely. And also, I think. Uh, when the government started this single child policy from 1979, whole China wasn't ready for this policy. So you can see that the whole generation, or now I have to say two or three generation, two generation at least, lots of parents, they are a single children as well. Then they struggled. Like one mother said to me, I don't want a child because I don't want my child to take my position from the center of the family. It was like, a, wow, you know, never thought about this. So Chinese culture is come from this kind of traditional family structured rooted culture. You know, mm -hmm. we're not very different from the Westerners based on, you know, religion or this kind of, uh, how do you, central beliefs? No, our central belief is family. If you learn our language, you can see even the Western, you say, my God, what Chinese say? Chinese say, what a tian, what a Maya, my mom. Yeah, even we swear, we swear, grandma, swear mom. And, uh, you know, it's based on the car, uh, family culture. If someone promoted in the position, we say, you are my parents now, fu mu guan. Mm -hmm. means we'll have to follow you. Mm -hmm. So for the young generation in this kind of feast, it's fast changing. And also, um, kind of suddenly open, everything come in at the same time. You know, it's very hard for them. And also their parents couldn't help them either because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard. I think uh, we need to listen to them, give them a more chance to share, not just force them to marry, to get a rich man, or to you know keep a beauty for the. No, many of them when they married, when they had a child, they found that they don't have themselves anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's very interesting um, the Chinese culture you were talking. I think for for people you and me, we educated in China, grew up in China. You feel very natural and strongly shaped by the culture because we were exposed to Western culture as adults or young adults. Um, it's I find it slightly easier to find um, to balance the two. But for there's a question from Guru Sky. Um, pardon me if I'm not pronouncing the name right, say for adopted children, when they are adopted from China, they, many of them feel the lack of an identity as a Chinese person. Uh, what, what, what are your feelings on that since you've been working on the bridges of uh, mother's love? I totally agree with her and I understand that because uh, you know, over 150,000, maybe 6,000, 160,000 adopted children in the 27 country already. But if you go to their uh, living area, you see how many books about China, okay, about Chinese culture, except the cooking. And the cooking is full of the sweet, sour, pow, the pork, or chicken. <laughs> you know, and in fact, the real Chinese, we don't eat that sweet sour chicken or pork. That is invented in Hong Kong for the British taste, you know, in the this kind of colonial culture. So for many adopted young adopted Chinese children, there are really a lack of the this kind of support from their local living area. 
And also in China, we still have this kind of problem. It's not just kind of freedom of the speech, it's kind of the traditional or powerful information for them to see. It's not just a very limited color for them because of that you can't feed the children or with just a, you know, two, three colors of the culture is no. And also something very dangerous in the website, uh, even from China, is they don't want to mention this kind of human trafficking, which is a very serious in China. And also they don't want to talk about adoption, which is a start in 1992 from China and from central government. You can see very limited information about this. You know, even the Chinese they don't talk about this because uh, other family, I believe if any children survive being adopted, you are lucky. You know, I had a book called The Message from a Chinese Mother and talk about this mm -hmm. because uh, in Chinese culture, we know that we always keep the boys for the family trees, okay? And they kill the baby girls. So the baby survived, but okay, we are talking about, you know, before 1960s or 50s, mm -hmm. and you are lucky, but when the one child policy stopped, when the parents or farmers, no choice, only had one child or two children, otherwise you could be banished or lost your house or everything. So this kind of policy and made a lot of peasants and made a very suffering choice. I interviewed some Chinese mother in the village, you know, when she thought my husband is a foreigner, and she said to me, do you know the big nose had our child? First sentence, I was like, what's that, big nose? No, foreigners had a big nose, you know. Yeah, the foreigners, their big nose had our child? I said, what do you mean, had your child? And they said, oh, we heard it. They took our child, they buy our child, they bought our child. So all I realized is adoption. In the village, they knew that. And then this lady said to me, say, please tell them if you know who they are, hold the baby on the left. Because the mother's face is very different from Chinese mother and the big nose mother. The heart pumping to say at night I cried the whole night. Oh. It really is. So I believe she was the one of the mother and her daughter. You know, but no one really openly talk about this. Mm -hmm. In America, you have a group of young children, they set up an organization about this. I think over 600 of them together. And I used to have a telephone meeting with them. So when they ask my question, how could I leave my Chinese mother? So I asked her, why you use the forgive? So that means she did something wrong. Don't mm -hmm. forget, when you have a life survived, that means your mom is a very brave, keep you alive. Secondly, the family great against the winter policy. I'm very dangerous, yeah? And the third one, they help you get a new home, opted with a beautiful, happy family. So how much in their heart is a bigger hole there forever? Mm. So this is why I, understand why so many adoptees, you know, struggle with that, where they could find, you know, this kind of roots, this kind of earth for their Chinese heart to grow. But I do believe China is much better now, much, much better. You know, during my travel back to China, once and once from volunteers, from local people, even policemen, if you ask them, could you help me? We found, you know, document some girl was left here and the policeman will help you. So people need a time to come out from the past and from the fear, 
from the darkness. Mm -hmm. But I believe one day will come and it comes soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hina. Um, I believe we are already running out of time, but oh, sorry. So everyone wants to know, what are you working on now? We'll just do this as a last question. Are you writing okay. a new book? I'm writing, yeah, I'm writing my new book. It's about the Chinese men. Wow. It, yeah, the first book. Uh, about the Chinese man because I met his daughter after he died. And this daughter discovered his father's, uh, her father's secret uh, diary. So secret. she was a very, yeah, secret diary. And uh, then she realized her parents married and her, his, her father's uh, in a deep heart and uh, about life, about actually Secretly, secret there is is uh, his lover letters to three men in his life. His wife, his daughter, and his secret lover, which his family never knew before. And so we are trying to tidy up this. It's very hard work, but I want to try to understand the Chinese man first time. <laughs> It, it'll be very interesting read. Thank you so much, Xinyan. I think regardless of whether it's Chinese women or men, it's just your eyes, the way you, you tell stories, I think is fantastic. I am sure it will be a, a wonderful read and I wish you lots of luck. Keep us posted when it comes out. We definitely want to have you back in the book club and read your new book as well. Thank you. Thank I will try to answer the question as well. And also, <laughs> I really want to thank you and really I admire what you do for well the China. Yeah. Bring the real China to the real people. Thank you. Yes. You when you can travel, travel with Wild China. When you can't travel, read all these wonderful books about China. I think it's it's such a fascinating world, right? Um, so we are uh, almost we're out of time. And uh, let me just have take one minute to talk about the next book club next month in february we will read the great wall in 50 objects and we will invite the author of course a long time while china friend william Lindsay, to talk about it, about his book on the great wall and you can sign up it's on our website already whilechina.com and uh i think february on chinese new year's day I personally will do a Chinese cooking demonstration and talk about Chinese food a little bit. So if you have time, join us and celebrate and make some jiaozi and dumplings and uh, celebrate them with family. And from there, I will say happy new year, happy Chinese new year, stay safe. Thank you, Xin Yan. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.